Lethal Company is horrifying, but it's also kind of hilarious. Oh my god! Run! Run! <laughs> About two months ago, this game made its way to early access on Steam, and has since taken the internet by absolute storm, being the newest craze that everyone's talking about. Obviously, there's a pretty good reason for this. It's accessible, it's cheap, and it's easy to play. And most importantly, it can be played with friends, and features proximity voice chat in terrifying scenarios. But one of my favorite things about this game is just how expertly it manages to balance its horror and comedy. Let me describe a really common scenario in how a round of Lethal Company might play out. You land on a moon, you and three friends eager to meet your quota. Along the way to the facility, you're probably going to be talking about some random bullshit or messing around until you finally find the main entrance or the fire exit. You enter the facility and decide to go in a direction away from everyone else in order to spread out and more efficiently collect scrap. You don't have any difficult altercations and you end up finding a bunch of stuff to bring back and when you get to the front of the facility, you leave the scrap at the front door and you realize that it's a little quiet. Too quiet. And it has been for a long time. And thus the question arises. Lethal Company's most terrifying question. Hello? Where did everyone else go? The reason why I really like this question is that it doesn't just apply to when you realize that your fellow crewmates have gone missing. It's also a more unconscious, underlying question that permeates the entire game. Throughout your time as an interplanetary scrapper, you'll come across many places that lack human inhabitants entirely, despite all facts pointing towards them having had people there at some point. Once you start thinking about things like this, you start to ask even more questions, like why are we even collecting scrap in the first place? What's up with the company that we work for? And who is Sigurd? And what happened to his crew? All of these questions and more will be answered in this video. I think the most appropriate starting point for our investigation is the ship that we spend a lot of the game in. As soon as you load in, you get an introduction over the speakers from a text-to-speech voice welcoming you to the company and informing you that the autopilot ship you're in is going to be where you eat, sleep, and live for the duration of your contract. Now, how long is this contract? It seems like evidence in many places points to it being a season. But if you've played the game before, you know how ridiculously difficult it would be to play for that many in-game days. If you look around the ship, you'll find suspiciously propaganda-esque posters littered across the walls, including messages like, your life is in good hands, and a poster in the corner promoting food preservation, which implies some sort of famine or state of economic decline. Even just that poster alone carries a lot of the weight of Lethal Company's storytelling, and it tells us about the state of the outside world. On the desk, there's a clipboard labeled as a service manual, which is basically a full tutorial for the game. There's a few things to note listed here, such as how the terminal gives you access to the company store, and the in-game currency is aptly named Company Credits. I think it's intriguing that this faceless company also doesn't have any branding, or even a proper name, being referred to as just the company. It also seems to control pretty much every aspect of the gameplay. Another interesting piece of information is the mention of a company named Halden Electronics. If you were to go over to the terminal immediately after starting the game for the first time, you're first met with a prompt on what your favorite animal is. But this is not nearly as interesting as the dates we can see on screen alongside of the question. The terminal computer has an associated copyright from 2084 through 2108 from the same electronics company, and the current year as of the main gameplay is 2532. And if you thought that was crazy, that's not even the most intriguing thing inside of the ship. It's this inconspicuous little sticky note. It reads, You're in deep. 
access file Sigurd. If you go over to the terminal and type in the word, you get access to Sigurd's log entries, and you're given the first log from August 22nd. This is the first of 12 logs, with the others being scattered throughout the various moons for the player to find, with a few others not currently being accessible within the game. These logs are where we learn the bulk of Lethal Company's story, told through the narrative lens of one of the members of a crew that came before you. Now I already told you the first log was dated August 22nd, but I didn't give you the year. 1968. Not only does this say that the world in Lethal Company was capable of interplanetary travel a year before we even went to the moon, but it means that this campaign to find scrap has been going for well over 500 years. Now immediately when I learned about this, I thought, okay, there's no way that this sticky note has survived inside of a spaceship for 500 years without being thrown out or damaged in some way, and the information within the logs that we'll learn soon was likely passed on through multiple crews on that very ship, and left behind for the current crew that you play as to eventually find. As I said previously, the logs were left behind by a man named Sigurd, and he asked his fellow crewmate Desmond to add a logs feature to the very archaic terminal. This means that the operating system that the terminal runs on may have barely changed, if at all, since 500 plus years ago. And it makes sense, because the terminal that we use in-game is also rather archaic. He talks about how these logs should stay on the terminal for a long time, as long as the computer doesn't get a total wipe, and that whoever is reading this is probably from a different crew, since the turnover rate for the job is massive due to constant deaths. I find this to be kind of confusing, since the copyright that we saw for the terminal didn't exist until over a hundred years after these logs, despite the data being intact. So this is why I don't think it's trying to imply that the same exact computer was being used for that long, but more so that the data and operating system were simply being transferred to newer machines. At the end of this first log, Sigurd lists the name of everyone in his crew, that being Richard, Desmond, Jess, and himself. The subsequent logs tell us a lot more about Sigurd and his experience working for the company. In the second log, he talks about how the suits are uncomfortable, along with some other unimportant banter. The important thing to take out of this second log, though, are the last few sentences, where he says, Today we found a couple frying pans and a big nail, worth almost nothing. What is the company even using it for? The seeds of doubt have been planted in Sigurd's mind. He already has no idea what the company could possibly be using this scrap for. The next few logs elaborate a bit on the company itself. In order to sell goods, you need to visit a dark, dreary, and absolutely massive building on an ocean moon. Sigurd describes getting his nerves chilled listening to the fucking psychotic sounds behind the counter. If you've played the game before, you know that the items themselves don't even get collected by a person, but instead by a mass of tentacles that reach out from a slot near the window. Apparently it has a name, and it's Jeb, but I don't think this is very important. Later, Sigurd talks about how shady the company is. He was enticed by the high pay with a contract that was only meant to last a season, an assessment exam that everyone did over the phone. But he also says that everyone on the crew signed their contracts together, and nobody actually spoke to a real person, with Sigurd noting he thought the voice over the phone was fake. On September 4th, when Sigurd and his crew visited the company building early in the morning, he swore that he could hear a sound behind the wall. He described it as, like crying red faces all churned up and swept away by concrete, like the pestle and bull my mom crushes her seeds and spices in. Sigurd would have recurring nightmares due to this experience, but that's not even where it ends. On September 13th, Sigurd describes having to call the company number to report an accident. Apparently, everyone else was too scared to do anything about it. He says how it sounded like the same fake voice from before, 
and how it talked really fast and just said they'd contact the family and find a replacement. No time for mourning, I guess. Just find another expendable cog to turn the gears that is the company. In the same log, Sigurd describes how he learned that you can hear the same screams he heard before if you use the walkie-talkie whilst near the wall of the company building. Nobody believed him before, but after he did that, everyone in the crew could hear the sound. They believe him now. And finally, the last log available in-game currently is that of September 27th. It seems Desmond is trying to make sure Sigurd records actually important information on the logs rather than just talking about nonsense that happens day to day. Sigurd doesn't take too kindly to this and continues to include his rants in the logs. However, there's something else that we can learn here. Something sinister and completely insane. Apparently, when they had to call the company number in order to report an accident, Desmond traced the call and found out that there's a group of people somewhere else that pretends to call from the company building on that moon. In reality, the people over the phone are across the whole solar system. And Sigurd asks in his log, why would they be so far away? Desmond says he doesn't know, but I think, what if there really is a big monster in the company building like the voice told me on the walkie-talkie? They trapped it and we feed it to keep it tame. I just wanted a stupid job. And that's where the actual in-game story ends, but if you thought all that was bad, you should hear what the unimplemented logs have to say. The very next log describes how Sigurd communicated further with the voices inside of the walls. Apparently, a golden planet is a popular legend in this universe, but the voice Sigurd talks to says that this planet really existed, and that it was swallowed up by the beast, and they were in its body being digested. When Sigurd asked for clarification on what this beast was, it said it didn't know. When he said that the voice was stuck inside the building, that voice started freaking out and talking incomprehensibly, to which Sigurd would just turn off the walkie-talkie and end the communication, nonchalantly disregarding the feelings of the voices trapped within the company building. The next log is titled Goodbye, and it details how Richard died from a Bracken attack. It stated September 7th, which means it's probably the incident that Sigurd had to make a phone call for from his log on the 13th. He says, I wanted to find Rich, even if he was dead, but they are cowards. Their faces are blank like idiots. There's nothing moving in their stupid skulls. All they wanted to do is leave. They were going to leave me too. We all hated Rich, but we didn't want this. This isn't worth it. It's just not worth it. We got a pair of scissors, a box full of stamps, and a bundle of cords to sell for nothing. It's not worth it. What does the company even want it for? Next, we have a log from September 19th, which talks about Sigurd giving the idea to Desmond to try tracing the source of the phone call from the company. It also details how after Richard's death, they stopped taking as many risks and were safer than before, though obviously this made them less money. Eleven days later, on the 30th, Sigurd describes how he's been having terrible nightmares, where he describes the company breaking out of the company building wall. He also describes how Desmond told him the voices from the company phone call were too far away to figure out if they were even real voices. Sigurd also deposits the idea that maybe they should try to take control of the ship's autopilot in order to travel to where the phone call originates. It seems like at this point they had the mentality that they had nothing else to lose. After hearing this idea, Desmond dismisses it and says that that could kill them and asks Sigurd if he's crazy, to which he says, Yes, I am crazy, Desmond. Finally, the log ends with Sigurd wondering why he doesn't remember getting on the shuttle, and doesn't even remember saying goodbye to his dad. He's starting to not remember anything aside from working for the company. The final sentence in this log reads, In my dreams, it feels like the company isn't trapped in there at all. It's just hiding. I don't know if I'm going home. 
The final log unfortunately implies that Sigurd may have been proven right with his last statement. It's titled Desmond, dated October 3rd, 1968. I am encrypting these logs to keep them hidden as I fear the system will be wiped if they are found. It's all a guise. We're supposed to think it's all just a transaction, but our real job is keeping an incredible terror fed. How long until its fullness ends and its hunger is insatiable? God knows. Maybe it has to do with all these desolate moons. Whoever reads this, I'm sorry to burden you with this. Please have a good day and night, as what else is there for us to do? Considering Desmond wrote the final log that we have access to, it's probably safe to say that Sigurd passed away. And I think that the way that the company operates is just to replace whoever dies right away until eventually the crew that was there before is a completely different set of people. And this cycle just goes on forever and ever and ever for over 500 years. Based on all of this information that we've gathered from the logs and from the environment and the enemies within the game, I believe I have a pretty good idea of the kind of picture Lethal Company is trying to paint. This probably goes without saying, but the company building is definitely harboring a giant monster. Either that or the building literally is the monster. Sager seemed to also refer to the monster itself as the company. This monster is giant enough to consume an entire planet made of gold and the people that may have lived on it. Strangely though, it seems to be pretty disinterested in organic matter, and the company is specifically hiring people to find scrap metal to feed it. One theory that I've heard before is that the monster prefers items with sentimental value, which is used as a way to explain why something like a perfume bottle would hold more scrap value than an engine or just a metal sheet. And while I do enjoy that idea, it doesn't really hold up when you look at the entire list of items and their values. However, what I think is definitely no coincidence is that gold bars hold the highest scrap value when we've learned about it eating a golden planet. The company itself is mostly a mystery, but it's clear that they have nothing but ill intent towards those that they hire, simply exploiting them for their own benefit for as much as they're worth before throwing them out or replacing them as if they're garbage. The company has no branding, no tangible human employees behind the scenes, or even an actual name. It's just called the company. The other strange part is how people who sign the contracts to work under them won't even remember how they got into that situation in the first place. We don't really know how this is possible, but it's probably just another part about how the company brainwashes people into working for them. Basically, everything in the game is a self-contained employment loop of death. There's also a really, really interesting easter egg if you go underneath the company building through the catwalks. There's a giant submarine looking object that seems to require two apparatus parts in order to be powered. On the side, spray painted in red, are the words, don't tell. Considering the planet that the company building resides on is an ocean planet, this may be a previous crew's attempt to find a way to explore that ocean and find out the truth of the company building. Editor here. On further inspection, I believe that the submarine looking object Manaxa described here might actually be a drill. People's opinions are pretty split on this one, but when players checked through the game files, they found that the object was in fact labeled as a drill. Currently, I believe the features of the drill have yet to be fully implemented, as bringing the apparatuses to its location doesn't really do anything yet. But what I can say is that Lethal Company likely has more in store for us in the coming updates. When it comes to details regarding the outside world, aside from the poster suggesting a famine and Sigurd's logs, we kind of have no clue as to what's happening out there. Though if I had to guess, the reason why there's a food shortage is most likely because the machinery used to harvest and process food has been sold off to the company as scrap. The fact that they need people to venture to other moons to fetch scrap from places people no longer inhabit tells me that they've probably run out of stuff on Earth a long time ago. 
Another possible theory is that the food shortage could have been caused because the monster actually eats organic matter, too. And the reason for a famine could be that most of the food production is being devoted to the monster. As far as the enemies and moons in the game go, I think it's hard to say anything concrete about most of them. The moon descriptions are vague at best, but we know Titan was specifically mined for resources, and experimentation was described as being used in secret. Perhaps this means that it was a settlement made separate from the company which was later discovered. Vow's description is probably the most terrifying of all of these, though. It says, Vow appears to have been inhabited by several colonies across its continents, but there is now no sign of life, and they have become a mystery. About half of the enemies in-game can probably be categorized as species native to their moons, whilst the other half seem to be deliberately man-made, or just straight up don't make sense, either because they're supernatural or just don't fit within the other categories. One thing that I find to be pretty interesting about the monsters is that a lot of them aren't found outside of the facilities you venture into, and those facilities are often also equipped with stuff like turrets and landmines. Now, are these defenses to keep outsiders out, or are they to keep the monsters in? Another strange aspect of the enemies and moons in this game is the eclipse phenomenon, which causes enemy spawn rates to increase dramatically, which makes your life way harder. I'm not sure if this event has any lore significance, though. If I had to guess, it's probably just a Berserk reference. Curiously, these facilities can also be controlled from the ship, and tend to still have some kind of electricity active in them despite being practically abandoned. Why is that? Isn't it strange that the company ships can still manage to do so much to the systems of abandoned facilities? It really seems like the company does have an alarming amount of control over pretty much everything. Despite these abandoned facilities, moons, the evil corporation, and everything in between, there's still no evidence of human life anywhere in the game aside from you and your crewmates. And I think that's the scariest part. Everything in the solar system is directly under company rule, and it seems like it's something trying its damn hardest to masquerade as human. All of these things, every aspect of the gameplay and the lore of Lethal Company, serves to reinforce the terror behind the question, where did everyone else go? The answer, in my opinion, is equally as terrifying as the question itself. We don't know. But if I had to guess, our answer probably lies just beyond this wall. I think the lore of Lethal Company is a really neat addition to a game that's already genius in a lot of other ways, and I hope you guys found it as interesting as I did and enjoyed this slight departure from my normal content. I hope to see the lore expand with further clarification in future updates, as the game is still in early access and might have a lot more in store for us. Finally, if you had a good time, it would mean the world if you subscribed for more content like this and turned on post notifications so you never miss a video. If you want to support me further, $5 channel members get early access to new videos, and you can also follow my socials and join the community Discord server. That being said, that's going to be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time.